Hello, I'm Tabitha Mofoni and welcome to On the Farms of Africa. This is a show that brings you various tech farming methods, trending and emerging agribusinesses in Africa. This week, we take a look at dairy farming in Kenya with a key focus on the milk and its value addition. Later, we talk to Mr. Alex Kathi, a dairy nutritionist, on dairy production, policy and marketing. Dairy farming is a key contributor to Kenya's economy. Tani Lope and Rhino Park Dairy Resource Center have marched and set their foot forward in ensuring a hunger-free nation. Let's have a look at their story. Dairy farming is the single largest subsector of agriculture in Kenya, among us horticulture, crop production, fisheries and forestry. At Rhino Park Dairy Resource Center, we are a, a dairy farm that is doing it strictly as a business. We are a dairy demo farm. We were launched under Landolix. That was in 2010. Here, we, we carry out various activities, but our basic, basic and core, core business is milk. A lawyer by profession, Wamai is based in Karo, Nairobi, and is a co-founder of Rhino Park Dairy Resource Center, and it was after merging with Tan Lope Consulting Firm that their revenues became an equitable order of the day. How I ended up in, uh, in uh, dairy is passion. And uh, apart from my passion, I lost my job in the formal employment. I couldn't just sit down and cry, so I decided uh, what did I want to do and what, and so I went into dairy. My partner Tanalope came in with his expertise, so we improved on our breeding, our feeding. We also brought in uh, biogas to help us reduce the cost. We also uh, mix our own rations, that's for the dairy meal, because we're trying to put our overheads down. Dairy farming is a business. Dairy farming is a science. You use science to do business. If you do it as a science, it's a research center and you don't make money. If you do it as a business without using science, <laughs> you'll be surprised. So you marry the two and you make your money. According to Kenya Livestock Research for Rural Development Report of 2017, the dairy subsector contributes about 8% of the gross domestic product with an annual milk production of 3.43 billion liters. My average production for the lactating animals is about 30 to 35. As now you can see, we don't have very many calves. That means most of the cows are at what we call the plateau. Because what happens is like the first three months of lactation, the production is quite high. Then it goes on up to about the fifth month, then it starts dipping. So that's the plateau stage. There's one dam that has just calved down two days ago. And uh, the last lactation, it was producing 30 liters. So we are hoping this time we can be able, if we feed it properly, we can achieve 35 liters per day. For the animals that we milk thrice, depending on the stage of lactation, we feed them thrice after every milking. And the diet has to be balanced. Just like for us humans, we need proteins, we need carbs, we need you know, vitamins, we need clean water. In fact, the water you feed your cow should be water you, should you can take yourself. Because composition of the milk, over 80% is water. Don't be happy if your cows are not taking water, you won't get the milk. To enhance a higher milk production and monetary value, a number of factors are put into play. Hygiene is very key, both personal and for the animals. As you can see, uh, the cleanliness here comes out as a win-win situation because the dung we remove here, we use it for biogas. So on one end, the place is clean and it keeps the animals healthy. And secondly, we are using renewable energy. The breeding is also very important. The animals, because we're not talking about the number of animals. We're talking about productivity of the animals. So instead of having maybe a herd of 100 cows that are producing 10 liters each. You can keep your 20 animals that are producing 30 liters each and you'll, you'll be in business. And another key thing we're looking at is not just about uh, farming in like the traditional way. 
we're talking about commercializing. That means mathematics is also very key. We have to check that the number of animals, the, our costs, and the profits, we have to, it's, it's a calculated thing, it's not kienyeji. Alex, a dairy nutritionist, is very particular on the feeding of the cows as well as on the prevention of the diseases. So basically how we feed a cow is that we calculate 3% of its body weight. That's the exertion per day. Yeah, 3% of the total body weight you calculate, that is the total amount of feeds you give it. And basically it's between 14 to 19 kilos dry matter. Dry matter is a scientific word. What is important in, in the feeds we are giving to the cow? The source of the dry matter could be the dairy meal, could be the boma roads, like now this one. It could be rusan, it could be cariadra, it could be desmodium. Basically, the dry matter can come from many sources. And the higher the dry matter, the better for you. So that's basically what we do. Like now for maize silage, the dry matter is about 30%, 28 to 32%. That means for every 10 kgs of good maize silage, you have about 3 kgs of dry matter. For bomarod, is about 95%, depending on its quality. So for 10 kgs, you get about 9.5 kilos of dry matter. That's very good. That's why you hear most farmers talking about uh, the, the, the roads or the bomber roads has a lot of milk. How do you prevent the diseases? Because the majority of those diseases are blocked by, are blocked by sins of commission and omission. You have omitted to give, provide something to these animals. For instance, if you don't provide mineral supplements in terms of powder and in terms of mineral blocks, there will be a deficiency, a mineral deficiency. And that mineral deficiency may occur in so many forms. For instance, when this cow calves down and it, had, it, it, it never had enough calcium, it will not rise up. So you will call a vet to inject with a aromatic calcium. But if you had given it enough calcium before then, using the DCP in the feed formulation, you prevent that. So when it's calving down and there is retained placenta, that is a, min a sign of mineral deficiency. So why can't you do a good steaming up program, you feed it well with mineral supplements, so that you prevent that situation where you, be, you have retained placenta. Milk fever, mastitis, all those things. Like now mastitis is brought by the sphincter muscles of the teeth. If it does not close after milking, it closes after 30, 30 minutes. So if there is exposure to bacteria, then there will be mastitis. So how you prevent that? You are able to use mastrite and you prevent the disease. We have six principles when you're doing the combat. Ensure maximum light, maximum space, maximum rest, maximum air circulation, feed. Just like the human demographics, every cow is registered under the Kenya Statistics Body. Basically what happens is just a terms of reference, because every animal here has its records, in terms of uh, date of birth, when it, uh, who's the dam, who's the sire, and then uh, it has a reference with the Kenya Start book, because you've registered them. Then, as the herd grows, you have to identify them because if let's say one has a problem and as you can see most of them are black and white if the vet comes and i'm not around i can simply tell him sydney is the one that requires what or a particular animal named is the one that needs your attention so we do that for identification uh, there is the routine vaccination that comes most all the vaccination and vaccines come from the government. But routine, we do it once a year. The grading system of the animals, we start with the foundation. That is the animal that we don't even have any data on. No history, we don't know who the sire was. By sire, I mean the bull. And for those, who, for us in the dairy industry, we call, the, the, the mothers, we call them dams. So the dam, we have to know the lineage. So the foundation is the basic. Then from foundation, you go to the intermediate. Then from intermediate, you go to the 
appendix. Then from appendix, now you go to the, the pure breed or the pedigree. We improve by selecting bulls from various uh, service providers and we check on the traits we want to improve on the animal. We also look at uh, longevity of the animals. That's the lifetime net merit of the animal. The longer the animal stays in your herd, the more profits. So you also have to look for cows maybe with uh, calving ease so that you don't have uh, complications while giving birth. You can have all this if you do selective breeding. You can even determine the kind of milk you want to have because there's the A1, A2 milk. You can even select animals that are less susceptible to diseases like mastitis by just checking on the, gen the, the, the genetic records uh, that show you the, a lower somatic cell count. Cows have a lesser what? Lesser uh, susceptibility to, to mastitis. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have good technology uh, like embryo transfer. We have selected uh, bull semen that actually is for just hyphas, hyphas conception. So we are hoping with uh, enough research we'll improve and get better results. We have registered our animals. We have also insured our animals so that uh, if you don't have a collateral, you can actually go with your with your certificates to the to the bank, and they'll give you some 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 credit. The waste from the cows is used in learning institutions as well as in the farm, with the dung being a very beneficial renewable source of energy and thus used as biogas in the processing department. Marianne, Wamai's wife, who is a banker by profession, is in charge here. I discovered that when we moved here, our cow used to give us some income. I decided to leave banking. I receive the raw milk from Wamai, I measure it and I produce yogurt mainly because that is what is in demand. Although we also know how to value adding cheese making, maziwa mala, etc, etc, even ice cream, all that. But yogurt is what is in demand. So how do we process yogurt? Yogurt is very simply processed. It's not chemicalized as many people think. Uh, all you do is you sieve your milk, make sure that it is good milk. Uh, for me, I don't have to do any tests because it comes from the farm here. Thereafter, now I pasteurize. Pasteurization means you actually heat the, the milk with water underneath and then there is a milk can where the milk is lying. So that is what pasteurization is. And simply what it does is to kill the bacteria that is bad in milk. So that now after that you can be able to, to take it in with all the vitamins and all the minerals intact. When you're actually processing yogurt, as you pasteurize, you'll have to add ingredients. We add sugar, we also add stabilizers. We could also have a modified starch just to make it a, a bit more thicker. Thereafter, after you heat, you have to have a thermometer. You heat it up to about 90 degrees for five minutes to ensure that all bacteria has been killed. Then you cool it down to another 43 degrees where you inoculate what we know, what is known as culture. Culture is a good bacteria that is required in all human beings. So people think that culture is also a chemical. And I want to assure our viewers that that bacteria is very useful for, for people. So we add that there's a certain quantity that you measure. Then after that, you will have to incubate the milk for four to six hours until it turns into yogurt. Yogurt looks like a, a cake. It's known as a coagulant, a mass which is very um, like, like ugali. From there on, you'll have to cool it further to 20 degrees and then you stir it. Stirring, you, you can decide now to separate it into strawberry flavor, vanilla flavor, etc. For me, actually I offer very many flavors. Strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, blackcurrant. The biggest challenge is the, the branding, sourcing of enough capital to do the branding and use of energy. That is why we are using biogas. Uh, and that's why again we are also innovating our own branding. It's very difficult to infiltrate the market. By this use of my branding, I've, made, I've cut down my cost of production because the minimum uh, branded caps is too expensive. It's too unreachable for me. So I, just my own innovation, decided to brand in my own way. And yet, 
the yogurt is still beautiful at the shelf. <laughs> yeah. In terms of product knowledge, by our people is a bit I, I appreciate people have started knowing yogurt, but I would appreciate if they understood yogurt is not a chemical. And the other thing is that if they could appreciate with the local people who are doing processing to be able to buy from us. Because uh, what they keep asking, is this homemade, is this machine made? They don't understand that this product is made the same way. It's just because they scale up, they, they'll have to have a big industry. For us, the other thing that we, find, we face in the market is that the taste of our yogurt is different from the one in the market. And it's due to the fact that this is raw milk. There's nothing removed, no cream. It's wholesome milk. The taste is different and better than the other one, which milk, the, the cream has been removed. Probably there are more additives. People don't understand that the real yogurt is the one that comes as raw milk, whole milk yogurt. I would advise that farming is doable. It is not rocket science as the youth, youth think. All you need to do is to focus, get the right information. We are a demo farm. If you want to know also about value addition, we will teach you. Get the right information. Don't go listening to other farmers or other people telling you, do this. Get the right information. There are resource centers all over the country. We are one. Get the right information and do it with a lot of zeal and determination and hard work. And obviously you are going to get something out of it. By the way, farming right now is the thing because uh, the population is so huge and we don't have enough to feed everybody. The dairy farm has had its own fair share of challenges. Apart from the diseases, which can be vaccinated and maybe, but it's, an, it's quite expensive because uh, we are hoping to partner with some of our research stations here so that uh, we don't have to import most of the medication. And uh, another challenge is uh, the licensing, there are too many business licenses in Kenya. To do a small business like ours here, which is a cotton gin industry, we, we are dealing with about three or five, three to five licenses. Because we have to get the caps, we have to get the standardization mark, standardization mark, we have to go to the dairy board, we have to get a, a single business license, we have to get the health license. We wish we could have all this at a one stop, whereby we can just go maybe to one uh, one, one body that authorizes all, all that. Because it, it's a, it takes a lot of time and then it takes a lot of money. Because for every product, like uh, if you're going to cabs, for every product is 5,000. So if I'm doing ghee, 5,000. If I'm doing yogurt, 5,000. If I'm doing... And we have, over, we have over 800 products that can be gotten from milk. So you can imagine it's, it's a limiting factor also. That's the business environment we have in Kenya. So we hope the, the other stakeholders would assist us in uh, trying to assist the farmer in giving them some rebates and uh, maybe some concessions. Because we're, 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 we are the key role. We're, we're trying to feed this nation. We're, we're, that is one of the pillars of the big four. We have to feed our people. We want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So we, we hope that uh, this gets to the right authorities and they can assist us because we are doing our part. Let them help us do their part. Apart from that, another challenge is finance is very expensive to get. Maybe we have to get into circles and because uh, the mainstream banks, the loans, uh, the, 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 the interest rates are uh, way way off. So we are hoping there are people who can partner with us, like our local government also, the counties. Uh, we have to say give kudos to them, they've given us uh, assistance, especially the groups. But for the individuals it's a bit challenging. So we were hoping the same people who, who are assisting the groups, they can, they can vet the farmers like us who've been in business for quite a while and they can vouch for us we don't want handouts we want loans that are well well you know interest rates are down we don't want free thing freebies we want to do business we want to have that 
uh, that uh, environment where we can, so that we can also assist in paying the ta of taxes and everything. That's how the farmer should be treated. With the hard work put into the farm, their market niche has played out well. Basically, we are dealing with raw milk, and that will be phased out very soon, because all milk that is going to the consumer should be pasteurized. But they are still the traditional, uh, do we call them conservative uh, consumers, who want the raw milk. So those ones come and collect. We have the institutions. We can either pasteurize the milk for them, or if they want to take it raw and go process it themselves, we still do that. We are also affiliated to a cooperative, Kikuyu Dairy Farmers. And we are lucky our location is good. We can, we can last with the Ololaisa, in, that's in Kajiado. We are in Nairobi County, but we are close to Kiambu. Nairobi is, the dynamics are just too good. The, the farm gate uh, prices are very good. Uh, we're doing at about 75 to 80 shillings for raw milk. Uh, we also have a good clientele that is paying up front. We are the people who owe them the milk. That is a business uh, model we've uh, come up with after losing a lot of money. Uh, in, in business, you go on learning through. Uh, experience is the, is, is the best teacher. To say you're going to be in dairy farming, you have to have at least six animals to start with. Then uh, at least producing about 25 liters and uh, getting a price of maybe about 30 shillings per liter. You'll be just at least emerging as a business person. So what you do is that, start with one, perfect it, then you can copy paste. You can do it and we are doing it. It's something that is doable. It's business, it's what we are living on. And we are taking our, we are going through life normally. Our kids are going to school, college, and we can afford it through our business. So we can't say that uh, there's nothing that cannot be done. If you have the passion, just go for it and you'll get it. With eight cows and some calves, and each producing at least 30 to 35 liters a day, Rhino Park Dairy Resource Center and Tanlope Consulting Farm will have played a huge role in feeding the nation and contributing to the well-being of the country's economy. And next, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Mr. Alex Gethi, an analyst and a nutritionist with Tanlope. But first, here is a look at his profile. Alex Kathi has a bachelor's degree in food science and technology from the University of Nairobi, Kenya and a certificate in project management from the Kenya School of Government. He also has a certificate in dairy production and processing from the Galilee College in Israel. Alex has received various awards such as Feed the Future Africa Lead Program 2015 by USAID, awarded by the former US President Barack Obama. Notably, he is also a personal assistant to the late Honorable Professor Wangari Mathai from June 2003 to March 2005. Currently, he is the managing director at Tan Lope Consulting Firm and other remarkable dairy institutions. What does Tan Lope exactly do? Tunnel Consulting Farm will support the data investors to make their data investment work for them, to make money for them, to make sure that for every coin, for every um, penny they put on the data farm, you get another penny, you make profit. So we support them uh, with the feeding solutions, cow comfort solutions, data management solutions, the ICT we are talking about, the innovations. We provide them with the technologies, appropriate technologies like the milking machines, the sided choppers, uh, everything that you use in a dairy farm, the cow mattresses, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. We also provide them with the basic advisory services, business planning, you know, business mentoring. Sometimes you even need to talk to a farmer and you do the mentoring of that business so that it grows to the next level, from an SME to a medium-sized level business. Let's look at uh, challenges facing our dairy farmers. What are these challenges and how do we deal with them? Uh, basically in Kenya the challenges are quite uh, similar to every other sector in Africa uh, or any other country in Africa. The challenges could be alleged from poor quality feeds, uh, high cost of uh, input, lack of funding, um, 
low uptake of innovations. That again is also part of the challenges. And um, yeah, and also the farmers might set. That also needs to be changed. Those are some of the major challenges that uh, dairy farming is going through. Yes. And what business models can we come up with that will help empower our farmers? Uh, owing to the challenges, that includes also the, the challenges in milk handling, because most of the farmers are not doing what we call GMP or GAP, good agricultural practices and good manufacturing practices. Um, it's important that uh, they can't even break even. The dairy farmers in Africa cannot break even. Very few countries in Africa can break even. So the models that we basically encourage farmers to do is pulling together. Some people call it cooperatives. Uh, in Israel, we call it kibbut system. Uh, you come together, you put ca your cows together, and you manage them under you one unit. You're able to give them the best uh, services. You're able to come up with a feeding, uh, feeding center where all the feeds are prepared. You're able to enjoy what you call economies of scale. You're able to, to ensure that the milk produced is of high quality. Yeah. So pulling together, coming together, you put, put uh, about a thousand cows or even two thousand or five thousand cows together, like they do it in Saudi Arabia. You're able to, to make even profit. Those are the models we are encouraging farmers to, to take. Uh, what growth opportunities do we see for our farmers in the near future? Uh, the growth opportunities are enormous. Uh, look at the world population is growing. Is, I think now we are hitting almost 8 billion. That's quite huge. Uh, the Chinese market, they are opening up. I think the president is taking a delegation to China where they open up a market for Kenyan produce and products. China is about uh, almost 2 billion. That's a huge market. Yeah. So Kenyan farmers supplying. Let, let's see the other side of China, actually. Mm -hmm. Let's not just see that they have uh, taken the Kenyan market. We can also take over the Chinese market. And uh, let me tell you, Chinese market is huge. So in terms of dairy products, uh, there's, uh, marketing uh, markets are opening up yeah. all over the world. And... Um, People are, uh, uh, there's product diversification, yogurt uptake is very high, m m milk, uh, fermented milk, we call it uh, mala, I know you like mala, it's also very good, <laughs> yeah, cheese, geese, um, even cheese is taking up, but then the market, the cheese market in Kenya is taking up, yeah, just try cheese, one of these, uh, the, the Gouda cheese, you know, the cheddar cheese, they're taking up quite well in the market. So the, the future is bright, yeah. but we have must adopt the light business models for dairy production. What advice would you give to upcoming dairy farmers? Uh, dairy farmers, you call them that. I call them dairy investors. I call them wow. dairy entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because that way we'll be able to change our mindset. Yeah. This is an investment. Like, just like the way you put your 3, 4 million or 10 million in a matatu industry, you can still take what your $1 million dollars investment and you make your own farm. For upcoming dairy investors, and I would really encourage the youth, anybody below 25 years should be able to venture into the dairy sector. Use the right dairy models, use the right uh, technologies, use ICT, like now the smart cow, uh, dairy, dairy app. You can manage your, 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 your dairy farm uh, at the comfort, uh, at the iHub. You are in the iHub and you are managing a farm in Nyeri using a, a smart cow app. Mm -hmm. You know, th those are the things that uh, uh, the upcoming uh, young youth uh, investors should take up. They should not only invest in real estate, in ICT or any other sector, let them also invest in agribusiness. There's a lot of money. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. You're it's welcome. Nice on the show. Pressure too. Thank you, Madani. That's all we had prepared for you today. But tune in again next week where we get to explore more areas in the agribusiness sector. From me, Tabitha Muthoni, and the entire On the Farms of Africa team, have a lovely week.